I'm standing on the corner of Highway 6 and 375, the state of Nevada. Follow 6, continuing to the east, you'll end up in Eli. Take 375 to the south, you'll be on what is known as the Extraterrestrial Highway. The town of Rachel lies almost 60 miles ahead of us. Things Vanessa and I really enjoy about Nevada are the mountain ranges you encounter. You'll drive for 10, 15, 20 miles across a plain such as this, and then you'll cross over a mountain pass. And you can see this is a repetitive pattern that happens over and over and over again in Nevada. That's actually quite pleasant. It's like going from wave crest to wave crest on the ocean of land that is Nevada. Lake, which by the way is a dry lake, is a good place to do any kind of development of, of advanced aeronautics. If you look to the front of us, you'll see there are several ranges of mountains. This highway is actually blocked by several, another range of mountains crests off to the southwest, so you really never can see Groom Lake as you're driving along. Notice that these ridges pretty much encompass us 360 degrees around. So these valleys are basically encapsulated by mountain ranges. The plane we're on now is roughly a mile up. We're at about 5,250 feet. As you look towards those mountain ridges to the south and east, you'll notice a line of clouds forming over them. This is a classic weather pattern you see throughout the desert southwest. Basically, whatever water vapor is in the air is turned into a mist by hitting 100% humidity as the air rises above the peaks. Because as air rises, it cools, and as it cools, the water vapor that's in the air all around us begins to form um, the cloud pattern. One of the reasons I bring up these meteorological factors is because the phenomena of people viewing UFOs can get entangled at times with the clouds. So, for instance, clouds can take unusual patterns, especially when there's like a nexus of clouds coming in from different directions at the same time. You can get these whirling effects, some call lenticular clouds. And not only that, the lenticulars can be very small. Meanwhile, any flashing of light off of the bottom of these clouds can give very, very unusual phenomena that looks like a zero-gravity craft rapidly making changes in motion. If you're going to be honest in your investigation of UFOs, you have to be very, very clear that what you're seeing is not meteorological in nature. We're about 20 miles from Rachel right now. We're anticipating the road ahead. Anticipating the road ahead is going to start turning left so to the southeast at some point. This, by the way, is the first vehicle we've encountered coming in the opposite direction from us. And no one has passed us. This is one lonely stretch of highway. We're beginning our swing to the east after having gone almost due south for quite an extended period of time. It's to a sign off of Highway 375 called Cedar Gate. We have only low resolution maps of the area. I wasn't expecting to encounter this road. I also discovered in looking at the map that we are not most proximate. We're about 18 miles from the Coon Lake location. While we're sitting here waiting for the car to cool off a little bit after our climb out of the valley, I'm going to basically give you a little backgrounder on the history of ufology. You can hear also in the background that there's some very loud conventional jet aircraft flying in the sky above us. I think there's at least two aircraft up there. Those obviously are conventional craft. If you follow the motion of a jet aircraft, which by the way we don't see right now, You'll notice that they fly in sweeping curves or along straight lines. Pilots 
are limited in the amount of g-forces that their bodies can handle before the blood flow to their brain is inhibited. Basically, that's seven to nine g's. The kinds of motions associated with those who report the existence of UFOs tend to exhibit g-forces into the 30 to 35 Earth gravitation range, well beyond the capacity of any human being, and potentially any extraterrestrial being, to handle. One theory put forward by ufologists is that, in fact, those 35 g changes in direction are not actually being handled by living beings. Uh, there is some indication that the creatures that may be inhabiting supposed UFOs are actually biomechanoids, which basically means part of them is biological and part of them is electrical-mechanical. And that would make sense if one were to believe that UFOs actually travel from distant star systems, were dispatched by intelligences in these star systems who themselves could not travel between the stars over the distances involved, but actually sent out emissaries in forms of artificial intelligence that could. In investigating the UFO phenomena, I've personally landed with the notion that we are not seeing beings who have literally traveled through the space-time continuum over distances limited by the speed of light. Conventional scientists basically explain the limitation of the speed of light as having to do with mass increases as one gets closer and closer to the propagation rate of light through the space-time continuum. That notion is only an approximation of what Einstein really meant. What Einstein meant was that any form of propulsion that required the conversion of chemical or other forms of energy into into thrust was limited by the speed of light because once you traveled the speed of light the very waveforms that are emitted would flatten out to the point where there'd be no more transfer of energy and the craft would basically hit an upper speed limit. For alien beings or even their biomechanoid uh, artificial intelligences to travel to the earth limited by the speed of light using conventional modes of energy release to go between worlds would require one year for each light year that they are distant from the Earth. Now, we might assume that the closest advanced intelligence to the Earth is between 100 and 1,000 light years away, which means limited by the approximately the speed of light where the waveforms of photons flatten out to the point of having no energy left in them whatsoever, it would take those creatures 100 to 1,000 years to get here. Astronomers will tell you over the range of 100 to 1,000 light years that there could be anywhere from two to 200,000 stars and stellar systems within those ranges. Bottom line is we're a needle in a haystack. Coming to Earth on the part of any beings would require that they somehow detect the fact that life is present on Earth and that Earth life is interesting enough for them to make hundreds of years long journeys to get here. There is no fixed notion of how long it takes a civilization to achieve a high level of technology. It's entirely possible that 15,000 years ago we could have achieved a kind of technology that in ways is more advanced than today's. Such a technology may very well have discovered approaches to transportation through space and through the atmosphere that is in far advance of what we currently do. We may, however, have developed a technologically advanced electronic civilization specializing in things like communications and computers that they never achieved. The reality is that we do not have to assume that anyone has traveled between stellar systems using conventional modes of thrust associated with the conversion of matter into energy. There's another possibility. This has been explored in science fiction in two ways. One is you can travel through ultra-dense matter known as uh, black holes by way of wormholes and instantly appear several hundred to thousands of light years away 
without necessarily traveling through space whatsoever. The other is, is that there is a medium of exchange of matter that exists beyond the physical that is not limited by the use of photon conversion for thrust. Basically, this is the warp drive concept as promulgated in programs such as Star Trek. So, any ufologists that hold to theories or hypotheses about the origins of UFOs would probably deprecate the notion of using conventional energy forms to travel at speeds approximating that of light. The basic problem of wormhole technologies is that there's a thing around a black hole called an event horizon. As you get closer and closer to the event horizon, the amount of gravitational pull on the part of you that's closest and the amount of gravitational pull on you and the part of you that's furthest away is different. This difference basically would tear most craft and living beings apart long before you entered a black hole. Black holes, however, can be used that are super, super massive. Their event horizons are practically flat and the delta between the part of you that's closest to the event horizon and the part of you that's furthest away is lessened to the degree that you are traveling through a supermassive black hole such as in the middle of galaxies. Well, supermassive black holes basically might be able to transport a craft between galactic cores, but it is not going to have anything that's useful to do in terms of traveling the other 26,000 light years necessary to get to our solar system from the core. So basically, my own thesis or hypothesis regarding transport between the stars is this. It is unlikely that any alien intelligence would travel to Earth either A, using light speed, or B, using black hole projection methods, wormhole projection, at all, especially given the tremendous number of UFO sightings being reported throughout the planet. So, where are, what are the sources of this phenomena that people are reporting in space? Keep in mind, I myself, as an amateur astronomer, have never seen anything that I could not account for in the skies. And therefore, from a purely repertorial point of view, am somewhat of a skeptic. There are those in the UFO community who now believe that UFOs are actually an extra-dimensional phenomena. They're not really physical things that are flying either between stellar systems. They are something that precipitates out of a higher order of substance, is made visible for a short period of time, and then is able to dissolve once again. This extra physical or supernatural concept of ufology basically says that it's possible to precipitate some kind of visible phenomena that had no real origin in the world around us for periods of time and then disappear again. And this is what is being seen by most UFO reporters. Now the fact that UFOs can be detected by electromagnetic means, radar for instance, they can be seen as light, photons, indicates that for some specific period of time the phenomena is able to participate in our physical reality. Now, in the Eastern traditions of metaphysics, there is a vehicle called uh, Maya Varupa. Maya meaning illusory, Varupa meaning form. And supposedly, these Maya Varupa are precipitates out of higher order substances into physical manifestations for short periods of time. We even have the notion of Maya Varupa in the Christian tradition. Supposedly, Jesus was hung on the cross and died, his body was buried, and later on rose from his crypt and was able to make physical contact with others around him, especially his disciples, Disciple Thomas, for instance. According to the Eastern Maya Varupa concept, Jesus, who was a very evolved being, was capable of precipitating a Maya Varupa and interacting with the world around him. And that is why he was able to be crucified and then rose from the dead. Historically, we can even go back further. 12,000 years ago, this planet was covered in vast oceans of ice. The continents 
were overwhelmed, especially in the temperate and northern regions, with tremendously miles-high thick glaciers. At that time, the oceans of the world that were liquid would have been several hundred feet lower than they are today. Given the propensity for human beings to establish cultures and civilizations along ocean front property, it's entirely possible that at one time there was a more advanced technological civilization on Earth in these currently inundated regions than modern thinkers are willing to admit. This says something very interesting about UFO technology. It is suggests that we've just missed something along the road. We missed the fact of a very simple technology that the ancients could have discovered that we ourselves have not. Back in the 1920s, a young science whiz, 17 years of age, by the name of Townsend Brown, was equipped with his own private laboratory. He loved electronics. His parents were well-to-do, generally provided him with everything he needed for his experimentation. His interest in electronics brought him to a technology known as vacuum tube technology. Vacuum tube technology basically uses a voltage potential between two plates, charges one, one plate up with a positive voltage and the other with a negative voltage and then uses a small heater to cause the electrons to jump from one side to the other. That's known as a diode, a two-plate diode system. Well, this young genius decided to do an experiment. The vacuum tube manufacturer said you shouldn't charge the plates more than 120 volts or so, DC. He decided to get a Van de Graaff generator and charge the plates to several hundred thousand volts. The result was the diode floated in the air. This is the basis of what is known as electromagnetic gravitics. That somehow, if you create a charge potential across two plates, it masks the influence of gravity on whatever is on those plates. Electromagnetic gravitics is said to reduce the weight of common things by 90% meaning that if you charge enough of these plate capacitors up to high enough voltages, it takes the minimal amount of thrust in order to cause them to move. An example of the use of the EM gravitics goes back to Homestead, Florida. There was a gentleman in the 1920s and 30s who built himself a coral castle made out of coral rock. He did this at night. The stones weighed several tons. Supposedly he had a little black box along with the usual mechanical slings and levers and he was able to position these five ton blocks to form his castle and its estate wall simply by moving these blocks around with his own personal strength. Eventually this man died and supposedly the black box that he used to generate the high voltages and the plates he needed to create the electromagnetic gravitic effect result were, was taken away by who knows who. Supposedly it was the United States Air Force. Is it possible that such a simple technology as charging plate capacitors to several hundred thousand volts could have been used by the ancients in order to use mass to move massive stones to create craft that were capable of flying through the atmosphere with the minimal amount of aerodynamic stress? Well, the bottom line of that question is anything's possible, but the reality is that we see very little evidence of the use of EM gravitics on the part of the U.S. and other aerospace agencies. What we see is conventional technology. We might ask, if such a simple technology can be used to reduce the mass of things, why don't we have plate capacitors in our cars so they don't weigh 3,000 pounds, they only weigh 300? The reality may come down to this. Such a technology is such a breakthrough technology, and it's relatively inexpensive, that frankly, just about any nation of the world could 
throw together several million dollars and develop this technology. So therefore, why would any defense industry such as the United States let anyone know that such a technology exists? The next thing you know, you've got craft flying all over the planet capable of all kinds of crazy maneuvers that are completely indefensible against. You have a security nightmare. Frankly, my own thesis, hypothesis about UFOs is, <laughs> this is a homegrown planetary technology. Some geniuses like Townsend Brown rediscovered it. It's been around for 12 to 13,000 years. Remnants of an ancient culture probably exist somewhere on this planet, and they do everything they can to lot, not make their presence known. Meanwhile, what do they see? It's now the year 2017. We have little laptop computers. We have phone computers. They see all this new technology emerging, and what they've been doing over time is upgrading their own craft used based on technologies that we human beings have now created that surpass their very own. So here we are, some 18 miles from a dried lake bed, where it's entirely possible that technologies that existed, archaeo technologies that existed 10 to 15,000 years ago are now being secretly developed and exploited by our own defense industry. Now, some people would say, it's very not unnice of these guys to do what they're doing. I don't know that. 14,000 years ago, a rock which was ejected from Mars during some kind of a large meteor or asteroid strike ended up in the, in the snows of Antarctica. That rock showed clear signs of fossilization on a nano micro, microbiological level. President Clinton came out with a big press release talking about the fact that we were now sure that life existed outside the Earth, at least on Mars, and within months it was completely repressed. Why? Revelations of Mars rock stood against certain fundamentalist notions of religion. And those fundamentalists who support this notion that life is intrinsic only to the Earth, that the Earth is a special creation, that God created no other life anywhere in the universe, that we're a special people, and that we adhere to a certain religious doctrine which precludes the possibility of life from elsewhere, went to work in our own government to make sure that any further investigation of life outside of the earth was repressed. Folks, we aren't ready. The revelation of alien beings, alien artifacts, archaeotechnology, all of this stands against the current worldview that is embraced by a large number of potentially influential people who see our old modalities of religion as being a necessity to deal with the fact that human beings have not been able to expand their consciousness outside of the very limited bounds of our own home world. Now I do have a critique of the deep state security apparatus that is supposedly repressing knowledge of these tech, simple technologies and their applicability to the world and its current environmental and energy problems. The critique is this. These guys have been way too heavy-handed. Reports are they're getting their finances using nefarious means, drug sales. Reports are they're involved in assassinations. Now, I don't know that any of this is true, but the fact is, if they had, if in fact they have kept their hands clean of all these kinds of negative behaviors, when revelation of these technologies occurs, everybody's going to say, of course it made perfect sense not to let people know. If anybody could build these craft with a couple million, who wants Kim Jong-un in North, North Korea developing UFO technology? So that makes perfectly good sense. But at the same time, this dark shadow side of secrecy that resulted in human pain and suffering 
repression of the truth through heavy-handed methods, that will not be so easily let go of. We will need some kind of truth and reconciliation process of a magnitude the world has ever seen if all the concept of the ufologist proves to be true. We're following a truck that's heading off into the distance. Apparently, it's just going to a direction that has probably nothing to do with the Groom Lake facility, heading mostly due west. Meanwhile, in the skies overhead, continuing to hear some very high-speed conventional aircraft activity that we're unable to actually find in the sky. about 50 plus miles left to go before we exit the extraterrestrial highway. As we continue to drive along the highway, I'm going to take a few questions from Vanessa. So, what do you expect or hope to see here on the extraterrestrial highway? Well, what I hope to see is some fine examples of landscape in the desert fashion. But in terms of UFOs, I don't expect to see anything. I think it's a phenomena that never comes about in my presence. So if you explain how EM Dravidics have made these um, craft very light, how is it that they maneuver them the way they do? Well, this is an extraordinary thing, and I don't think ufologists have really penetrated into this notion. Assuming the mass can be reduced significantly, how is it they actually create thrust? How do they move? change direction. Well, obviously, they don't use any flight control surfaces, because if you had used fins and little stubby wings, you'd get something that looks like a curve as you move through space. Yet these things seem to almost make right angles. So obviously, that's not the approach. Meanwhile, all reports are these craft are exceedingly silent, almost like they're balloons moving through space. No sense of any kind of thrust to move them forward. So what could account for them being so silent without well, having jets on? Well, this is very interesting. I personally have no notion of what kind of propulsion these craft use, which now leads us to the other hypothesis that was mentioned. These craft are not really physical at all. They are a Maya Varupa which means they present as though they're physical, but in reality, they're not physical. They can maneuver on the basis of just mental direction. So they can move up, down, left, right, any direction they want to go based on the mind of the manipulator of the craft. But that's not the Townsend Brown effect. The Townsend Brown effect explains how you can reduce the mass by 90%. So, if the U.S. government is developing these craft, they certainly aren't experimenting with Maya Varupa. They're not working with something that flashes in the physical manifestation, gives the appearance, such as, for instance, the Phoenix light phenomena that occurred in the 90s. These things were translucent. They didn't really seem to have a material presence, but they were perceptible. No, the government would have to actually create some kind of fusion of modern propulsion techniques along with EM gravitics to reduce the mass of the craft. Now, if I were developing the craft to use EM gravitics, I would use turbine fans. I would have electrical fans of high voltage potential that basically spun, and then I would use some form of sound nullification, because you can take sound nullifying headphones, for instance, can eliminate sounds from outside the headphones. So I would combine turbine fans with the impermitics to reduce the mass, and I would use some kind of sonic suppression associated with sonic waveform nullification, and that would give the effect of a soundless craft capable of extreme maneuvers based on propulsion 
using turbine, electro turbine fans that could easily move in different directions based on the fans where they're pointed very rapidly. Now there's reports by some investigators that experimentation with this kind of craft preceded that of Townsend Brown. For instance, in the Bible, there's a thing called the Ark of the Covenant. If you look, some have reported if you look at its construction, it's nothing other than a box filled with highly charged capacitors. Now, if somebody were to reproduce that phenomena, let's say in more contemporary times, they may have discovered that, these, that it's possible to create a 90% reduction in mass. Now, what would they do to provide propulsion? Anybody discovering the effect of EM gravitics based on high voltage charge capacitors would use whatever technology they had at the time for propulsion. Maybe they'd use a screw or a propeller. Maybe they'd even sit inside and get a bunch of people to pedal like a bicycle. The mass has been reduced by 90%. It's extremely light. Now it would be possible to sort of use whatever technology is available, steam engines, in order to get them to move. In fact, one investigator in ufology looked into a, a movement in the 1850s called the Sonora Aero Club. In the Sonora Aero Club, they apparently developed the capacity for lighter than air flight without the use of balloons. They may very well have used EM gravitics and some kind of screw mechanism for propulsion. Now we're going to talk about one related phenomena which I think has absolutely nothing to do with ufology. This phenomena is known as crop circles. According to our hypothesis, there really is very little link between these two phenomena. Crop circles are an expression of a high order artistic mathematical sense that we would not attribute in any way to the UFO phenomena of our time, which frankly are largely associated with phenomena such as abductions and gene splicing and have a very fringe, almost satanic association in some people's minds. Crop circles are very positive, very hopeful, and very expressive which some might say are almost angelic in nature. Now, Vanessa was telling me the last time we came through Nevada a couple of years back that we were parked on the side of the road, uh, probably overnighting, and a couple of black SUVs pulled up and then encouraged us to move on down the road. I don't remember where we were at the time. I don't even really remember the experience, but she seems to. So as we were uh, driving through, there were signs saying government property, and, and Jeff said, well, let's just see how far we can get into this region. I might have been around Area 51. Well, you know, 80% of Nevada is U.S. government property. That's true. I recall, Vanessa, that you yourself, unlike myself, have actually seen something that was suggestive of something not from around the block. Do you remember what it was? Oh, yes. I was standing on the street corner, California and Gulf Street, specifically with, the, with That was friend. San Francisco, right? San Francisco. But we could see the stars at night, and my friend pointed up to something that she saw moving, and she said, see that right there, Vanessa? That is a UFO. So I looked up, and the star it loomed in, got very big and then swoop, it just swished off in the opposite direction and what did she say but she said see they knew we were watching them so we just arrived from Rachel yeah and this is the closest human settlement that we know of to Groom Lake and it's physically fairly proximate within maybe 12 to 15 miles of the dried up lake bed which is associated with advanced aeronautic Ooh. technological. There's the sign, you know, extraterrestrial highway. Extraterrestrial highway. Well, 
welcome our friends to the Little <laughs> Ailey Inn, and that is oh my. the closest we're going to get to a saucer, probably on this trip. 